Hello, welcome to Granada Report. We are live with the latest across the Northwest. Thanks for joining us on the programme this evening. Loving parents have been robbed of their cherished children and others have to live with the physical and mental consequences of your actions. They lost their babies at the hands of a sadistic killer. Today, she refused to face them, to hear their pain. These hospital managers will have to answer why they didn't listen to the concerns of their consultants. One senior boss has told us she wasn't given any evidence, but in response, doctors have hit back. If you don't ask the right questions, you will not find the right answers. And we look into Lepby's past to find out whether there were any clues about what was to come. One by one, the families of the newborn babies murdered or deliberately harmed by Lucy Lepby revealed the terrible suffering they'd endured. They had to direct their words to an empty dock. The mother of one baby boy she'd murdered said her absence today was one final act of wickedness. Another mother said she's horrified someone so evil exists. But finally, some justice for them. Let B will stay behind bars for the rest of her life. The judge ruled she should have a whole life sentence for each of her crimes with no possibility of release. Well, let's cross now to our correspondent Mel Barham. Mel, absolutely heartbreaking testimony from the parents today. Yeah, Lucy, listening to what we have in court today has been harrowing and distressing. The families wept in the public gallery as tissues were passed between them and no one could fail to have been moved by those victim impact statements. To hear them all, one after another, and to hear the emotion in these families' voices was utterly heartbreaking and really brought home the reality of the evil crimes of Lucy Letby. As you say, the one person who should have been there to hear all of this wasn't. If she had been, she'd have heard these families talk about how their lives have been utterly shattered by what she's done. Some have been left with PTSD, depression, some even contemplating suicide. Relationships have broken down and many have been left with a deep distrust of others, including medical professionals. And one family described it as saying no sentence will ever compare to the excruciating agony that she's put them all through. It was the final insult. Lucy let be brought to court this morning, but remained in the cells, refusing to listen to the consequences of her heinous crimes. The dock at Manchester Crown Court empty, like the baby rooms of so many of her victims. The judge with no power to force her to attend. As he addressed the empty dock, the judge, Mr Justice Goss, described the cruelty and calculation of Letby's actions as truly horrific. Loving parents have been robbed of their cherished children and others have to live with the physical and mental consequences of your actions. Siblings have been deprived of brothers and sisters. You have caused a deep psychological trauma. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. She was the nurse entrusted to care for the most fragile of patients who instead chose to kill. Hello, Lucy, is it? Yes. Hello, my name's Chesh, please. So please step in two seconds. Oh, uh, yes? Yeah, thank you. This, the moment she was arrested by police back in 2018, led out in handcuffs, the realisation her murderous and premeditated actions were catching up with her. To a hushed court, the families of her victims finally got to explain how her horrific actions had affected them forever. The parents of babies A and B were first to have their statements read out. They were twins, a boy and a girl, born in June 2015. Baby A died just 24 hours after being born, let B injecting air into his tiny body. Hours later, let B tried to do the same to his sister. Mercifully, she survived. We never got to hold our little boy while he was alive because you took him away. What should have been the happiest time of our lives had become our worst nightmare. You thought it was your right to play God with our children's lives. Baby C's mother read her victim impact statement in person. 
He was a premature boy who let be killed by again injecting him with air. The mother of baby D then took to the witness box, clutching a small grey rabbit teddy, to tell the court how the murder of her little girl had left her life painfully empty. My heart broke in a million pieces. Their lives weren't yours to take. I can't forgive you. There is no forgiving. Not now. Not ever. The mother of premature twin boys, babies E and F, talked about how they'd been extraordinary miracles after failed IVF when they thought they'd never be parents. Baby E died after being injected with air. His brother miraculously survived being poisoned with insulin. His mother saying she's regretted every day the decision to bury baby E in a gown picked out by Letby. The statement by Baby G's parents was read by the prosecution. Their daughter, born at just 23 weeks, survived multiple attempts to kill her, but has been left severely disabled. They spoke of their pain that she will never have her first kiss, get married or get to experience what other children her age will. Every day I would sit there and pray. I'd pray for God to save her. He did. He saved her. But the devil found her. The prosecution also read out the statement from Baby I's mum, a little girl born at 27 weeks. When we lost her, they said, a part of us died with her. The mum of Baby N, a premature boy who survived Letby's attack, say she knew instinctively he'd been deliberately harmed. The pain, she said, was immeasurable. We both relive this every day. And in what was a deeply emotional final statement from the parents of triplets baby O and P, shown to the court as a video, the court heard the deep, traumatic pain their deaths have caused to their family. Lucy Letby has destroyed our lives. The anger and the hatred I have towards her will never go away. It's destroyed me as a man and as a father. On each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of the court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence, and you will spend the rest of your life in prison. Calls are now deafening for a new law to force criminals to face their punishment and the families of their victims. Mel Barham, ITV News, Manchester. It is so heartbreaking for anyone who is affected by this and struggling. There is some support available. There is information on where to find it on our website right now. That's at itv.com slash Granada. Well, Letby's refusal to face the judge and those families today has angered many people. The mother of Olivia Pratt Corbell, who died a year ago, says her heart goes out to the families after the nurse did not appear for sentencing. Yes, I was in court for the trial of the man who killed Olivia, Thomas Cashman. It is 12 months tomorrow since he murdered the nine-year-old on her doorstep in Liverpool. He too refused to enter court, not only for sentencing, but also to hear those important family statements. It is something Olivia's family have been campaigning to change. So let's speak to our political correspondent, Andrew Misra now, who is in Westminster. Andrew. Well, Olivia Pratt Corbell's mum, Cheryl, launched her Face the Family campaign earlier this year because she believes that the very first step in the rehabilitation of any criminal is that they should listen to those victim impact statements in court, particularly because they're so difficult to write. It wasn't, didn't take minutes. It was days over a matter of weeks. Um, and it's important for the offenders to listen to the pain that they've caused, the pain that is ongoing. Although judges can't literally drag offenders into court for sentencing, prison officers can use reasonable force to get them into the dock. If they still won't come, then theoretically more time can be added onto a sentence. But you can see in the case of Lucy Letby, that wouldn't make any difference at all because she's already been given several whole life orders. So this isn't necessarily straightforward. But nevertheless, earlier, the Prime Minister repeated the government's promise to change the law on this. 
I think it's cowardly that people who commit such horrendous crimes uh, do not face their victims and hear firsthand the impact that their crimes have had on them and their families and loved ones. Now, we are looking uh, and have been at changing the law to make sure that that happens, and that's something that we'll bring forward in due course. Now, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has accused ministers of dragging their heels on this, but it is expected that this legislation will be included in the King's speech in November, which is where the government sets out its priorities. But there is still the big question here of how this might be done, especially if it might lead to further distress for victims' families, which is what we saw back in 2014 in the case of Lee Rigby, the soldier from Greater Manchester. In that case, the killers had to be removed from the court and taken back down to their cell during the sentencing because they'd started brawling with security guards. So, as an alternative, one former Justice Secretary has suggested that the sentencing could be broadcasted live into the offender's cell. Andrew, thank you. Well, next tonight, the former director of nursing at the Countess of Chester has been suspended from her current role at the Northern Care Alliance Foundation Trust amid allegations she was slow to act about concerns about Letby. Alison Kelly is one of three executives at the Trust under increased scrutiny. Her response will be amid the focus of a public inquiry into how senior bosses responded to consultants' worries. Speaking out for the first time on the condition that we don't show her face, the head of nursing says the senior management team all have questions to answer. Emma Sweeney reports. It was once just an ordinary NHS hospital, but it is now the focus of a public inquiry. One that hopes to establish how a nurse turned murderer was able to get away with what she did for as long as she did and how several concerns raised by senior clinicians were repeatedly ignored. The former executive team will now have questions to answer. The consultants allege Alison Kelly and Ian Harvey had been aware of their concerns about Lucy Letby for months. Tony Chambers was the chief executive at the time. He says he didn't know about Lucy Letby at all until July of 2016, when she was removed from the unit. But even then, consultants say the executives were reluctant to believe them. The families are very clear in their view that they want the most detailed and full inquiry that there can be. Um, and that would tend to, to, to lean towards it being a statutory inquiry, where, of course, witnesses can be compelled uh, to give evidence as opposed to merely invited to give evidence. One of the central themes will look at why executives didn't act sooner. It is also bound to highlight just how broken the managerial system was at the Countess. Astonishingly, the head of nursing for critical care at the time claims she was kept in the dark about concerns surrounding Lucy Letby until May of 2016, almost a year after she began to kill. I am surprised that they, they never informed me and or my divisional director, so... That's the only comment I can make. I really don't know why they didn't. When the former head of nursing for critical care was finally told, she says she felt reassured by the unit manager, Arian Powell. She said Lucy Letby does everything by the book. She follows po policy and procedure to the letter. But that gave me some reassurance because obviously the unit manager was working really closely with Lucy Letby at the time. The head of nursing and the unit manager were then asked to produce this assurance document in response to the consultant's concerns. Now, the top line reads, there is no evidence whatsoever against Lucy Letby other than coincidence. Lucy Letby is described as excellent and diligent in this document, a conclusion, of course, that was horribly wrong. Just one month later, she went on to murder two more babies before she was finally removed from the unit. One consultant believes the reason why Lucy Letby was able to operate in plain sight was because management had already made up their minds. I genuinely believe what's happened here is that when we first raised concerns and when we continued to raise concerns, they were not, they were not courageous enough to acknowledge that it could even be a possibility. And they decided, therefore, it couldn't have been that. And all of their actions from that point 
were framed around that belief. Lucy Letby is removed from the ward in 2016. It takes another year before they get the police involved. Why did it take them so long? To be fair to the executive team, you know, they commissioned a number of investigations. I think they were trying to find something to be able to go to the police with, I'm assuming. Um, it's something that they'd have to be asked why they didn't escalate quicker. I mean, it's a, it's a big thing, isn't it? Going to the police saying, we, th we think potentially there's somebody who's murdered babies on the ward. Were they worried about reputational damage? I, I really can't comment. I think that's a question that needs to be asked of them. The leading medical expert in this trial says the case should be a turning point. In his view, the whole system now needs to change. And I think we need to invert the lines of command within our hospitals. Currently, managers have far too much power and they are the ones who should be accountable to the doctors and not the other way around. It is, after all, the doctor who is responsible for the patient. We are yet to hear from Alison Kelly, who today was suspended from her post at another trust. Ian Harvey and Tony Chambers have told us they will cooperate with a public inquiry. It's not just lessons learned for all of us at the Countess of Chester Hospital. This is lessons learned nationally and worldwide because it's such an awful thing to happen. God forbid it, you know, anything like this happens to anybody else. Well, in a statement to us this evening, Ian Harvey, the medical director, refuted claims from the doctors. Well, we're joined now by Richard Scorer from the legal firm Slater and Gordon, who represented some of the families in this case. And also by the former Cheshire MP Antoinette Sambat. She's spoken very powerfully about in the past about the terrible experience of baby loss. Antoinette, first of all, let's come to you. Very tough today to hear from families. What's been the most shocking part of this case for you? I think, um, obviously, hearing the devastation that the murders caused and the trauma that it's caused to the families. And I think for me, what was um, what really touched me was that the descriptions of parents saying that they felt guilty for not keeping their children safe. And it's just devastating. I mean, it's devastating. I've, I've lost a child, as you know, in 2009. So I know uh, what it's like to grieve for a lost child. But the trauma to them was repeated by the fact that they that their children were murdered. And that uh, is absolutely horrific. And you did try to raise issues with the hospital about how they were dealing with baby loss in general and didn't meet with a good response, did you? No, obviously I was chair of the APPG on baby loss. We were looking at it. I know that the health secretary at the time, Jeremy Hunt, was focusing on it. The largest payouts and compensation for the NHS are, are due to negligence and problems caused in the maternity wards. So. I would say that any competent and uh, diligent chief executive should be keeping a very careful eye on their maternity departments. And the fact that three deaths happened in just two weeks, which was as much as the annual uh, record previously, okay. should have... Uh, should have raised massive red flags. Of course, Antoinette, thank you. Yeah, Richard, we need to come to you as well. Now, we know that there's going to be an inquiry. How important is it that that inquiry has statutory powers that actually witnesses can be compelled to provide evidence? I think this is really important that it does. And the point here is that we need an effective inquiry. We need an inquiry that can get to the truth. And in my view, that has to be a statutory inquiry. And the point about a statutory inquiry is that it has the power to do a number of things. It has the power to compel witnesses to come and give evidence, um, and it has the the power to compel production of documents as well so that uh, a statutory inquiry can be sure that it, it is seeing every document that is relevant to this and I think those powers are crucial to having an effective inquiry. And to learn uh, the reputation of the hospital seemed to come before contacting the police. Yeah and that's absolutely horrifying and it was actually said in those terms by a manager I mean it's extraordinary but but and, and outrageous and completely wrong and we have to get to the bottom of how that kind of mentality can can, can occur in this in this situation. Okay, uh, Richard, we have to leave it there. Antoinette as well, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Well, the question everyone is still asking is why. Today, one family said, never knowing why, 
meant that there would forever be a wound left open. It's a question that has defeated the police and the courts and can only ever be answered by Letby herself. Gamal's been looking into her life to see if there were ever any signs of what was to come. A carefree Lucy Letby on a night out with friends. Dawn. <laughs> Footage posted online more than a decade ago. So can the traits of the serial killer be found in her past? Lucy Letby was born and raised in Hereford, where she lived with loving parents. The family's home was on a quiet cul-de-sac close to the River Wire in the historic Cathedral City. For police who've studied her past... I would describe Lucy Letby as being beige in, in, in her... Um, in my experience of, of her. And when I say that, I mean, she's unremarkable as a person. She had a normal life with friends, a normal social life. She was a nurse in, uh, you know, in her 20s. There was nothing remarkable about what she was doing at that time. Crimes at odds with the life she had. Lucy Letby is a teenager described by friends as one of the geeky girls and part of a group who called themselves the Mismatch Family. She dreamt of becoming a nurse in these years, so a degree at the University of Chester followed. Then, a poignant post in the local paper by the proud parents of the only child. Living in Chester and in her mid-twenties, Lucy Letby's achievements in life were ones many in her age group would have been proud of. She had a job in a neonatal unit and had bought a three-bedroom home here in the city. Throughout the trial, the prosecution claims Lucy Letby was a calculated killer, but there was nothing in her past to suggest she was capable of such crimes. Life in Chester also saw salsa classes and socialising. She would attempt to murder a baby before one of these nights. Can a life rooted in this reality be unravelled? One thing that really strikes me about Lucy Letby's case is that there's no known history of previous offending, specifically previous violence. And having assessed hundreds of mentally disordered offenders, I would say that's exceptionally rare. Usually, violence escalates over time, especially this level of violence, you know, not just the killing of one individual, but of multiple people. So it's unlike anything I've ever seen in my career. That may be so, but Lucy Letby also evokes memories of Beverly Allitt a nurse who murdered four children at a Lincolnshire hospital to draw attention to herself. The lead detective in that case sees similarities. And there are so many parallels. There are two children that have had insulin overdoses or been poisoned with insulin. There's one that's had air. There's one with squeeze injuries. So it's almost as if somebody's read the Allet book and that these are copycats. And for those who sat in court for the 10-month trial, Lucy Letby's a mystery. She did cry on occasions during the trial, um, but usually, it, I, I, maybe no coincidence, that when she did cry, it tended to be when we were focusing on what her life was now and what it was before she was arrested. She became very upset when the photographs were taken of her, came up on the screen in court of her bedroom that the police had taken on her arrest. I think it, it triggered some emotion uh, in her and she, she became tearful at that point. Lucy Letby is a serial killer who targeted the most vulnerable in her care. When she developed the desire to kill may never fully be known. But today, of course, has been all about the parents of her victims. So let's get some final thoughts tonight by going back to Mel, who's been following the case throughout. Mel. 
Yeah, Lucy, I've been a journalist for many, many years. I don't think I've ever seen anything so distressing in a courtroom as I did today. The families of the victims were in tears, jury members and police officers were in tears, even journalists were visibly upset. And I think it's fitting that the final words were given to the victims' families. The judge saying he'll make sure a transcript is given to Letby so she can't escape those powerful words. And I think it's important to note that some families were talking about moving on now. Now, one of them said, maybe you thought by doing this you would be remembered forever, but I want you to know my family will never think of you again. From this day, you are nothing. Another said, we have been living a nightmare, but for me, it ends today. Mal Barham, uh, Manchester Crown Court, thank you very much indeed. And that is it for us tonight. A reminder that support's available for anyone affected at itv.com forward slash Granada. Goodbye. Toilet or bin? Bin. Why? United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thank you. A very good evening to you. A warm feel in the sunshine today, but we have had quite a breeze across the region. As we head through into this evening, a few further showers to come and more cloud around with showery conditions during the day tomorrow. The middle part of the week, our weather will settle down somewhat, feeling pleasant in any sunshine. But gradually, cooler conditions will be moving in as we get towards the weekend. And it does look rather changeable to end this week. We'll be pulling in that slightly cooler air from Thursday into Friday. But in the meantime, still temperatures around average or thereabouts with uh, pleasant sunny spells to look forward to over the next couple of days. But a fair amount of cloud feeding in across the country as a whole. In the meantime, this evening, showery rain around, but by midnight, most places becoming dry, some breaks in the clouds, still quite a breeze around. And by the end of the night, for parts of North Lancashire and Cumbria, more cloud cover and patchy rain and drizzle moving in before dawn. A warm night for most, 14 or 15 Celsius, and fairly breezy conditions continuing as we start the day tomorrow, when the sun will be up at 6.01 setting at 25 past 8 tomorrow evening. Tomorrow then, more cloud around certainly than today, less breezy weather during the afternoon, outbreaks of patchy rain through the morning migrating their way eastwards across the whole of the region. A few brighter skies getting out during the afternoon, but quite cloudy and damp, a little drier perhaps to end the day. It won't feel too bad if you catch a sunny spell, 21, maybe 22 degrees. The middle part of the week will be a little dull, but largely dry. And then it's unravelling again into the weekend, changeable and feeling cooler. Cleaned up well. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather.